Hello all and welcome to Risk Out's webinar. Finally, the final rule, unpacking the new beneficial ownership changes. We are so excited to have you joining us here today. Now, before we dive into today's content, let's roll through some quick housekeeping items. Risk Out will be sharing all of today's webinar resources, including the slides, handouts, and the recording in a follow-up email, so keep an eye on your inbox. We also want these sessions to be as valuable for you as possible, so we encourage you to ask any questions that you may have throughout today's session in the questions section of the webinar panel on the side of your screen. We will be running a few polls throughout today's webinar to help better understand our audience, so your participation is greatly appreciated. For those of you that are joining us here today for the first time, RiskOut is a team of former bankers, regulators, and industry experts that have joined together to help community financial institutions unlock complex markets to increase deposits from within their own backyard. Through both software and services, RiskOut reduces the time, effort, and uncertainty around expanding into new markets so you can increase your footprint without having to open new branches. If you're interested in learning more, visit riskout.com and get in touch. Riskout is embarking on a mission to take the BS out of BSA. Manual processes for transaction monitoring, risk scoring, and SAR filing are too tedious, and legacy BSA solutions are often slow and dated, causing inefficiencies in the day-to-day -day back office operation. That's why we're developing a new solution, and we want you to be a part of it. If you're interested in working directly with RiskOut's product team to test features, provide feedback, and collaborate to build the transaction monitoring system you wish you had at your fingertips, you can join our Founders Program by clicking the link found in the chat box right now. Next month, RiskOut will be hosting the webinar, Preparing for 420, Specialty Banking and Cannabis Programs Unpacked, to dive into the dynamic realm of specialty banking with a specific focus on cannabis and hemp. Attendees will gain valuable insights into the intricacies of specialty banking, all the way from hiring specialized staff to setting realistic expectations and leveraging the right tools for success. Visit riskout.com to reserve your seat for this exciting webinar session. Today's presenter joins us from Harris Beach, Attorneys at Law, a firm that provides services to financial institutions of all sizes. Their attorneys handle matters before state and federal agencies, including the FDIC, NCUA, OCC, FinCEN, and OFAC. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit them at harrisbeach.com. Today's session is led by Constantine Lizas, a partner at the law firm Harris Beach. Constantine joined the, firm, the firm's Washington, D.C. office after leaving the FDIC's enforcement section as an acting supervisory counsel and the FDIC's lead BSA AML counsel. At the FDIC, he advised the interagency team that began drafting new rules pursuant to the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020. He also served as a federal prosecutor in the Department of Justice's Money Laundering and Asset Recovery section. Today, he assists financial institutions with examination matters, enforcement actions, government investigations, and compliance issues. We are very excited to have Constantine joining us again today. And without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it over to Constantine to dive into today's webinar content. Take it away. Hi everybody, uh, how's everyone today? Um, I'm ha happy to be back and I just wanted to say as we um, talk about now the final access rule that um, what I'm, that the discussion that we're having today is for informational purposes only and, and it does not constitute uh, legal advice. And yes, I know the, the lawyers made me say that so I just wanted to pass it along. Um, and look, should you need any further information or advice uh, going forward, uh, please feel free to contact me directly. Let's start by talking about the current beneficial ownership rule, which is the rule that right now everyone has to deal with. Um, as you all know, um, it's codified at 31 CFR 1010.230. And um, at the end of the day, there's um, 
um, two definitions of beneficial um, owners. The first is any individual that owns 25% or more of, of a legal entity. And then the next is um, a control person. The control person is defined as an individual with significant responsibility uh, to control, manage, or direct a legal entity. Um, that could be um, a CEO, CFO, managing member, general partner, president, vice president, and anything like that. Um, but the one big difference um, from today's current rule as to what we're going to see in the future is that that control person could also be a CPA or an attorney. Um, whereas in the future, you're going to see that the individual has to have substantial control. Um, the current rule has, um, uh, under the current rule, you don't have to report more than five individuals. Um, and also, under the current rule, at least one individual has to be identified, um, and that would be the control person. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, Constantine, before we do that, we're going to launch our first poll question here quickly. And that's just a quick question that you should see popping up on your screen now. And that asks, now that this BOI final rule is out, how confident are you in how it's going to impact your program and financial institution? We just have three quick options there that asks, uh, you either can be extremely confident, maybe you're just somewhat confident, you're still feeling it out, maybe that's why you're here today on this webinar, or maybe you're not at all confident. Uh, we'd love to give everyone just a quick second here to weigh in on how they're feeling about this updated rule and how it will impact your program. All right, uh, we've got a good amount of responses already in, so I'll go ahead and share those out as we're kind of doing a review on what we had before, what we're looking at today. Constantine, you can see we're kind of split here a little bit. So, uh, you know, about 20% uh, are both extremely confident or not at all confident, but most of our audience today is at that 60% right down the middle. They're feeling somewhat confident. How does that stack up to what you were expecting? It's a good question. Um, I was thinking probably a little bit more on the not at all confident. But um, so maybe I would expect 10, 10, 20 percent more than that. But um, but ultimately, um, it, it, uh, with that one exception, it's about where I thought it'd be. That's great to hear. Yeah, well, we're hopefully we can bump, bump some of our audience up into that extremely confident section today. Great. Um, all right. So let's talk about um, customer due diligence and beneficial ownership information, which are now foundational. Um, as everybody knows, they are six years old. Um, when they first came out, there was just those new chapters in the FFIEC manual, and everyone was still trying to understand what they are. Well, what we know now, six years later, is that they're foundational. Uh, we know that you need to, um, um, we, we, need, we know that you know that institutions need to know their customer to develop the risk profile. Um, and, and we know that regulators are focusing on the risk profile and they want to see that the risk profile is meaningful, meaningfully developed. How do we know this? Well, we know that from enforcement actions, where they're really focusing not just on customer identification, they're um, focusing on that, um, on the developing the risk profile, and they're also focusing on the monitoring as you go through the relationship, whether that's suspicious activity monitoring or just doing um, appropriate due diligence on high-risk customers as, as appropriate. But we do see a lot of emphasis now on. Uh, customer due diligence and beneficial ownership information. Um, one thing we really want to talk about is um, OFAC screening um, is intertwined with beneficial ownership information because, as we all know nowadays, that there is an emphasis on OFAC and that emphasis is here to stay. And if you and it, and you need to know whether uh, one of your customers is ultimately a sanctioned individual. And obviously, you would not want to bank that individual or, or put the appropriate uh, risk controls in place. Um, um, going forward, you're going to need to understand whether a sanctioned individual has substantial control um, of either now your legal entity or in the future, what would be called reporting companies. Um, and uh, the, whole, the whole issue with OFAC becomes pretty important because it really gives us a guide, I think, in, in, in future. But also, we'll talk about it more today about um, how we should look at uh, the access rule. And as you all know, that an OFAC, an OFAC a sanctions compliance program is not required, but we all know that it's basically a de facto requirement. And as I said, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but um, at the end of the day, while you don't need to do it, the way that it's enforced almost 
um, uh, forces you to go ahead and have a sanctions compliance program. So let's talk about the current um, beneficial ownership information rule. Um, and this is a bit of a of a, of a, a recap from last time, but reporting companies um, right now must report beneficial ownership information to FinCEN. That's 25% or more ownership, just like the current rule where um, legal entities have to report to you, but they'll also, but now uh, reporting companies will have to report substantial and anyone with substantial control of the entity. And there's no limit to the number of people that could have substantial control. Um, also, uh, for any new entity that's created since January 1 of 2024, the reporting company will also have to report the company applicants. Those are the people who physically press the send button to a secretary of state to um, incorporate or register a company or those who direct the filing. Usually it's the attorney, let's say, who, who would be directed on filing. Um, at the moment, the final beneficial ownership rule does not replace the current rule. And what I mean by that is that um, legal, and, I'm sorry, reporting companies have to still file beneficial ownership information uh, with FinCEN, but that does not replace the um, filing of beneficial ownership in information with the financial institution. So what are reporting companies? Uh, well, those are entities, um, either US or foreign entities, um, um, either in the United States or registered to do business in the United States. They generally are corporations, LLCs, certain partnerships, et cetera. And the key with all of this is that it we're talking about any entity um, that has to file with the Secretary of State. That, that's the key that kicks in the uh, Corporate Transparency Act. And um, as many of you probably already know, um, the Corporate Transparency Act excludes 23 types of businesses. Uh, those are companies uh, that are listed on a stock exchange, uh, banks, and large operating companies. Um, large operating companies are companies that have uh, more than $5 million of revenue in the United States and more than 20 employees also in the United States. So with, with the new rule, the burden is on reporting companies to report beneficial ownership information um, to FinCEN. Uh, they'll also have to um, report changes in beneficial ownership information to FinCEN. Um, there, there is one way around that um, ever so slightly, and that is if each of the individuals who are beneficial owners um, get a FinCEN identifier number, then the burden does shift to them to update their information with FinCEN and takes it off the company. Um, so that, that is something we'll, we're going to see a little bit more in the future. Um, with respect to the CTA, there's a civil and criminal penalties for companies um, that um, misreport, fail to report, uh, or fail to update their information with FinCEN. Um, last time we talked, we mentioned that there were 25 to 40 million companies that were affected. The latest and greatest uh, figures from FinCEN indicate that um, 32 million uh, reporting companies will have to report information to FinCEN. All right, so let's talk about some legal considerations um, in, in the final access rule. The final access rule is codified at 31 CFR 1010.950 and 1010.955. The final access rule has an expanded concept of customer due diligence. Um, in the proposed rule, uh, FinCEN had um, stated that the beneficial ownership information that an FI would get from FinCEN could only be used for the purposes of customer due diligence. And so while customer due diligence is a fairly broad concept, most people at that time thought it was really focused more on um, the process of developing a risk profile and maybe doing um, uh, appropriate due diligence for high-risk customers. Um, but as you know, the current um, CDD rule also includes ongoing monitoring to identify and, to support and report suspicious transactions, which basically means an AML program. So the final access rule removed the ambiguity and clarified that CDD covers uh, the entire AML program. Um, I also note that beneficial ownership information can be shared within the institution. That, that is the same as the proposed rule, um, including agents and contractors. 
Um, and I mentioned agents and contractors because that does include consultants and lawyers so that uh, one day if you and I are working together, you know that you can share beneficial ownership information with, with me. Um, now, with respect to some changes from the proposal to the final rule, um, the final rule now says that um, if once you get beneficial ownership information, it can be shared uh, within the institution, but outside of the United States. Now, with that being said, it can go outside of the United States, but it cannot go to Russia, China, states that sponsor terrorism and sanctioned countries. Um, you'll also note that in the final rule, there's no safe harbor um, for relying on the beneficial ownership information in the FinCEN database. Um, I mean, that means if, if you use it and you rely on it, then, um, then FinCEN wouldn't, let's say, um, conduct an enforcement action. Now, they didn't do that. But as a legal matter from a litigation perspective, it'd be very difficult for FinCEN or a federal banking agency to argue that a financial institution uh, failed a BSA AML obligation by relying on FinCEN's beneficial ownership information. But finally, in the final rule, um, there's no requirement uh, that a financial institution use the database. Uh, we're we're going to talk a lot more about this later, but for now, let me just say that there's no requirement to have an OFAC compliance program either. So let's talk about some operational considerations, um, and, and we'll go over this in a little bit more detail um, in a few more slides, but um, to access the FinCEN database, um, the financial institution is going to need um, a documented consent from the reporting company uh, to make a query with the FinCEN database. But FinCEN doesn't say how um, documentation will have to be obtained, and it's going to leave it up to each financial institution. Ultimately, this is going to affect uh, onboarding procedures and require um, some consent form to be um, a, a part of your onboarding forms. Um, once you go to access the FinCEN database, you're going to have to certify um, that you've received consent from the reporting company, and you're going to have to give that um, uh, certification to FinCEN. Now, you might ask, okay, how are you going to access uh, the database? We, we had some discussion about that last time, and we did mention that you're not going to have full access or searchability in the database, but you will have, you, there will be a way to make queries in the database. Uh, ultimately, FinCEN has said that there's going to be APIs. Um, that's still going to be figured out, but I suspect that you're going to have multiple um, BSA AML monitoring platforms and other vendors who will provide third-party APIs for you guys to use. Um, there's also IT security. Um, you're going to have to meet the requirements set forth in Section 501 of the Graham Leach Bliley Act. I'm not going to get into much more detail with respect to IT security. You can talk to your IT people. Uh, but the point is, there's going to be operational considerations. You're going to need to have policies, procedures, and controls to protect that beneficial ownership information, and also just on how you're going to then use the database. Um, for the different permutations that you're going to see and in terms of beneficial ownership information and how you're going to attack each different um, possibility that comes your way. All righty. So now before we get into the actionable takeaways of what should I be doing today, we wanted to ask a quick poll question. That should be coming up on your screen now. That asks, how likely is your financial institution to access the FinCEN database? As Constantine pointed out, it is optional. We haven't fully seen it yet. Things are still developing. But as it stands today, would you say that you are not at all likely, somewhat likely, or very likely to have your financial institution access the FinCEN database? Give you all just a couple more seconds to get your poll responses in here before we share these out. And you know what? Not unsurprisingly, this is looking very similar to the results that we saw on our first poll. Almost exactly the same. We have uh, about 20% saying not at all likely, about 20% saying very likely, but the majority of our audience, about 60%, saying that they are somewhat likely, kind of that right down the middle. Uh, I think we got a, a lot of people still learning, a lot of people sitting on the fence at this point, Constantine. How does this kind of stack up to what you're expecting or, or what you've heard when you have conversations with banks and credit unions? 
Yeah, the, this is about what I hear, and and this is what I would expect. I mean, I, it, I mean, this shows me that over 80% of the financial institutions are at least thinking about it. Um, I think that's a good thing. And look, um, I'm as we get into the next couple of slides, uh, I think implicitly I'm almost making the argument that um, financial institutions really should take a, a deep dive look at this. Um, but on the other hand, I I do understand that with respect to um, the database, there are some some pitfalls. But ultimately, I, I think um, that the benefits are going to outweigh the negatives. That's great. And thank you all for participating in another poll question. All right. So as, as we go on, then the next question is, should my financial institution access the FinCEN database? And I say, yes, maybe. Um, ultimately, look, that's going to be a decision that um, your general counsel or your chief risk officer are, are going to make. Um, and and let's go through that a little bit. Um, I uh, so the so we look at the next bullet point and it says what can we learn from OFAC? Well, as we discussed with OFAC, OFAC doesn't require a program. However, having a program is a mit mitigating factor in an enforcement action. And then we also know that um, uh, and that um, financial institutions that don't have a, an OFAC program are subject to um, he heavier penalties. And so at the end of the day, the way that it's been set up with OFAC is that, again, you don't have to have a program, um, but if you do violate OFAC, then we are going to hit you hard. And so that has really in, uh, almost created a de facto requirement, but not through uh, regulation, but, but really through enforcement. Um, so then you say to yourself, okay, why access the FinCEN database? Well, uh, putting your head in the proverbial um, sand strategy um, can be risky. Um, some commentators believe that FinCEN will not require um, or, or have suggested that um, financial institutions shouldn't use the database. Um, but the way that I look at it is there's a greater risk of enforcement actions in shareholder suits. Um, or to put it a different way, what, what's going to happen if there's ultimately information that's in the database that could have helped the financial institution um, avoid um, the enforcement action. And so that's where really one of the big things comes into play of, of whether a, a financial institution should consider um, having access to the database. Uh, there's a few more considerations though too. Uh, when we look at um, the whole idea of the Corporate Transparency Act, the idea of it was to minimize the burden or reduce the burden on um, financial institutions. And so, as we all know right now, the way that it's going, the Corporate Transparency Act actually increases the burden. And so, there's uh, institutions out there right now that are looking at how they can streamline, and I've seen at least two different proposals. What, one is that the, um, that the financial institution gets a consent from the reporting from all of their new customers, and then what they would do is, is they would just go straight to the database, get the information off the database, and then meet their customer due diligence and their, or, or really more specifically, their beneficial ownership information requirements um, in that manner. And, and, and that may be a way to go. I think a better strategy would be to ultimately have the, um, to have the reporting company provide the financial institution with a copy of what the, of what the reporting company submitted to FinCEN. And that does a few things. Um, first of all, the reporting company is still providing that information to the financial institution. Then when the financial institution goes to the database, it minimizes or completely eliminates any misalignment of the data um, from what FinCEN has and from what the bank has. And then at that point, once the financial institution goes to the database, then it can say, look, I've used information that is also with the database. And so ultimately that, that might be a strategy that really protects the bank, but also helps them to streamline their customer due diligence because they'd really just be getting a copy of what was already provided to FinCEN. And then ultimately they'd be sharing the risk with FinCEN. Um, also, just real quick, um, while FinCEN didn't provide a safe harbor, um, again, having the access to the database and using it is, is almost a de facto safe harbor in terms of how it would be enforced. All right, so let's talk um, now about um, uh, a case you may have heard of 
uh, about the CTA in the Northern District of Alabama. That case is called National S Small Business United versus Yellen. There is a federal district court that ruled that the uh, Corporate Transparency Act is unconstitutional. Um, the court held that Congress did not have the power to regulate the filing with the Secretary of State and that the filing of the sec the, that the filing with the Secretary of State is purely an internal state affair and doesn't trigger the, the Commerce Clause and some other considerations in the Constitution. Right now, though, this case only applies to the plaintiffs, about 65,000 reporting companies, and it only applies to the uh, Northern District of Alabama. So as a result, it doesn't apply anywhere else across the country. The United States uh, Department of Justice filed a notice of appeal, and as a result, FinCEN continues to implement the CTA to everyone else in the country. Um, so while this litigation is ongoing, um, FinCEN continues with the CTA. So if you hear from anyone in your institution that, um, that there's this case out there, you can tell them, yes, there is. But at the moment, unless you're in the Northern District of Alabama, um, uh, uh, FinCEN is going forward uh, uh, full steam ahead. All right, so let's talk, take a look at things um, about how to prepare. Um, financial institutions must also collect beneficial ownership information from reporting companies. Um, as we mentioned, the filing with, of beneficial ownership information with FinCEN does not replace um, FIs collecting beneficial ownership information. Um, expect in the future that beneficial ownership inf information filing with FinCEN to be consistent with the filing of uh, beneficial ownership information with financial institutions, me meaning that um, it'll be, instead of the control prong, they'll, that the new rule will also have substantial control and all the exemptions will be the same. For now, start thinking about keeping track of individuals with, with substantial control and the company applicants. FIs are, are going to need um, new beneficial ownership information procedures going forward before financial institutions access the FinCEN database. Um, you're going to have to establish all those safeguards uh, for IT and physical safeguards. Uh, you're also going to have to get that consent, um, document the consent, and, and have a procedure for the um, certification. Um, and then ultimately, you're going to need training. Well, training is not a per se requirement, but if an F FI does not train personnel and has issues, it's not going to get any sympathy from the regulators. So um, also you're going to need policies going forward. If you access the database, how often, under what circumstances, what to do with uh, when chaos comes. We will talk about um, chaos in a minute, but ultimately chaos is all the different permutations that you might see in the future of, of accessing the database. Um, and each of the different things that you're going to see going forward are going to need a policy and a procedure. That's right. That's right. And that does transition us into our uh, next question. Uh, before we dive too much into the chaos, we want to get a quick feeling for whether or not uh, you plan on asking your existing customers or members for our credit unions on the call, uh, if you plan on uh, asking them for consent forms. And that is, uh, you could select any of the following. That's a yes, always. We always want to ask our existing customers or members for those consent forms. Maybe only for some, maybe others not so much. No, you never plan on doing it. You're going to, at least for the time being, opt out of accessing uh, the FinCEN database or, you know, as we've seen with a lot of our poll questions so far, still undecided. We're still figuring it out a little bit here uh, and trying to decide which way we're leaning. Uh, give you all just a couple more questions, but so far, you all have been quick on the draw today. So much appreciated for that. And we will go ahead and share these results out. It looks like we had a uh, slightly different outcomes based on what I was expecting to see so far. Constantine, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but uh, still uh, roughly around that 60% of being undecided, a little bit more for this time. So that's not so much surprising, but we did have a quarter of our respondents on the call today say that yes, they do always plan on asking all of their existing customers and members for those consent forms. Uh, whereas 10% roughly say only for some customers, very small few saying, no, we're never going to use these consent forms. Constantine, what are, what are your thoughts here? 
Um, look, I see that um, the the majority is undecided, and and I think that's um, interesting. Um, and, and look, that's probably right. There's still a lot more things to um, consider uh, before we get to that point. There's still a lot more rollout and phasing in to go. Um, I think when I see no comma not never, I'm a little concerned. But I will just say that also depends on the risk profile of the institution and the risk profile of the customers. But um, but that one does give me a little bit of concern. Well, thank you all for for responding there. We appreciate it. Constantine, I'll let you uh, throw us into the, the fires of chaos here. All right, so chaos is coming. Look, you, you're gonna need to prepare for multiple issues, um, um, whether you access the database or not. Uh, the first issue, if you access the database, a new customer doesn't give you permission to, to search. Um, and then what do you do? Do you bank the individual? Do you not bank them? And uh, you know what, that answer may depend on the risk profile. Uh, second issue that will pop up, existing customer does not give permission. permission. Uh, then what do you do? Do you conduct uh, additional due diligence, file a SAR, de-risk? Um, these are all issues that need to be figured out. And again, ultimately, it'll depend on the risk profile of that individual customer. Uh, I mean, look, you, you might have a boring uh, basic um, account and maybe the issue is just some libertarian issue um, versus somebody, let's say, who's in a, a high risk business or a cash intensive business. Um, let's say you send a query. Um, so well, let's talk about um, the reporting company not being in the fin FinCEN database. You, you send a query to FinCEN and learn that the reporting company isn't in there. Uh, that might be okay if they immediately file. But, um, but then what if you contact the customer and they refuse to file? Well, that's going to be a red flag um, that um, the comp that the company is operating contrary to federal law because at that point you would you would know because they're not in the database. Um, then there's the issue of in inconsistent information um, in the FinCEN database. Um, that's going to have to be worked out. Um, you still might have information under under the current rule where you just have the control prompt. Um, you may have to collect information then for substantial control, or you're just going to have to work through um, that issue. Um, and again, that's going to be something that's going to need policies and procedures. Um, what if what if you know that the information isn't updated in the FinCEN database? or that the customer didn't provide you with updated information. Again, these are just issues that you're gonna to have to deal with. Last time we talked, I noted there would be a misalignment of information from day one, because we thought there'd be a period of time between the CTA going into effect and when the current rule is changed. But with the phased in approach of the access rule, it's likely that the CDD rule will be changed as the access rule goes into effect. So hopefully at least for new customers, you won't have that misalignment of information. And hopefully as you go through that process, um, you'll be able to quickly then get um, some additional information on the substantial control so that you, you don't have um, as, as much of a problem as you might, or, or at least as we thought you might six months ago. Um, look, and financial institutions will also need to prepare for when they don't access the beneficial ownership um, information database. What if the information in the database would have helped the FI in avoiding an enforcement action? Um, so whether you access the database or not, there's, there's going to be um, risks and benefits. Um, let's just talk about a couple other issues. Uh, one, one issue going forward is that you can't rely on a CPA or consulting firm to, do, to determine the beneficial owners. So if you have a customer who tells you, hey, here's my beneficial owners and my CPA did all the work, well, that's going to be a bit of a red flag because CPAs can assist with tax law as it pertains to the filing of tax returns. Um, but the CTA is not a tax return and determining beneficial ownership information requires legal work. Um, just as part of that process of determining beneficial owners, uh, lawyers need to go look at the operating agreement, need to look at the trusts, uh, need to look at uh, what clauses in the operating agreement um, have different effects, let's say like convertible instruments or you might have um, uh, voting shares of a stock versus non-voting shares of a stock. And these are all issues that are going to have to be determined on a legal basis. And so uh, ultimately, these are just many different things that you're going to need to look at uh, for policies and procedures. And again, that's whether um, the financial institution does access the database or doesn't. 
Constantine, this is super helpful. Before we move on, I, I think this is a great slide. We did have a question that came in and it says, is it my bank's responsibility to help FinCEN's database have the most up-to-date information on my customers? Do you speak to that at all? No, at the moment, from what we see, it it, it is not. Um, but, you know, and ultimately it does create an awkward situation for the bank. But uh, I, I think that goes back to what I was saying about if you know that the information is not updated, updated, I think the financial institution will need to work with the customer to have the customer update that information with FinCEN. So sure. in, 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 in that sense, hopefully there's a collaborative process um, so that everybody can get to the same point so that the um, information is aligned. Perfect, thank you for that. And as a reminder, if, if anyone else has additional questions that they'd like to ask, you can always do that in the questions section and we'll, uh, we'll get them answered as, as best we can. So just to continue with preparing and thinking about um, um, the different um, ways to share beneficial ownership information and how it ought to be handled within the financial institution, uh, we note that there's a different sharing regime than SARS. Um, as, you, as we've discussed, you can share beneficial ownership with um, information within the FI, uh, but you cannot share beneficial ownership information with other FIs. Um, and cannot share beneficial ownership information with affiliates. Um, and as you know, SAR information can be shared under FinCEN 314B. Now, what happens when there's beneficial ownership information in the SAR? We don't know yet. Um, that's something that FinCEN hasn't um, given any guidance on yet. Um, at, at this point, I would say um, not to put any beneficial ownership information um, um, in a SAR if you don't have to, or at least if you plan on sharing it through FinCEN 314B. Um, and then just keep in mind that uh, now, as we discussed, beneficial ownership information and SAR information can be shared overseas in some situations. And you just need to make sure that you work through those situations and that um, you don't get tripped up by, by thinking that they have the exact same rules. And so again, ultimately FIs will need policies and procedures for sharing beneficial ownership information. All right, let's talk for a minute about the New York um, LLC Transparency Act. Uh, it turns out that the act was finalized earlier this month. Um, it applies to LLCs and just LLCs registered or authorized to do business in New York. Um, it goes into effect January 1, 2026. Um, this creates a non-public database. Um, as you may recall um, from the last uh, discussion that we had, the, the original idea of the New York LLC Transparency Act was to create a public database. However, that, that's been changed through some amendments. And um, so now it, it mirrors the um, federal um, framework a little bit more. And in addition, the substantive terms in the federal definitions are the same. And the idea is ultimately that um, New York will now have its own database, that its own law enforcement will have access to, and um, other financial institutions and things like that may also have access. So, but at the end of the day, I, at the end of the day, the idea now is that New York will have its own information and not have to go to FinCEN. Um, and the idea was that by sending the same report that an LLC sent to FinCEN, that that they would send it to New York, the idea was to cut down on any of the issues. However, we've spotted now at least three major differences that are going to create some problems both for the reporting companies. Um, and for financial institutions. Uh, the first is that the reporting companies will have to file an attestation if there's an exemption. So right now in the current framework, if a, if a reporting company is exempted, it doesn't have to do anything. Um, now in New York though, it would have to file an attestation. In addition, anybody in the database would have to file um, an annual report, which, uh, and as you know, annual reports aren't required in, um, by FinCEN even though you still have a duty to update. And then finally, um, financial institution access. As you know, under FinCEN, you have to have the consent of the reporting company. Well, the way that the law has been drafted right now, it seems that um, the individual, I'm sorry, that the financial institution would need the consent of the beneficial owner. Um, so the, the issues here are that while this is, while maybe on paper this was going to be a pretty simple add-on to FinCEN, 
we're now seeing that there's a few things that are going to create some additional complexity, both for reporting companies and financial institutions. So um, stay, stay tuned to this developing space in how um, states um, will, uh, will, how states in addition to New York will then end up creating their own um, databases. Constantine, we, we actually did have a question just come in uh, similar to that, and that, that's asking, what's the best way to stay in tune to this? This uh, particular question says they are not based in New York or, or have any operations there, but they're concerned that uh, legislation could come along like this in their region and they might have to make adjustments on the fly. Is there a, a good outlet to keep up with these changes or should maybe they go ahead and update policies and procedures proactively just in case it does come? Right, I, I mean, at this moment, I, I think, look, um, pay, paying attention to different webinars, uh, there's a couple different le legal news alerts that that you can set up. Um, you know, even in Google Alerts, you can put in um, uh, Transparency Act or or something else. But but at the end of the day, or if you know the um, the company JD Supra has has legal articles. But um, ultimately, there's a few different places where you'd be able to get legal information that that keeps track of these things. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, and I believe that does bring us to our Q&A session. Now, before we dive too deep in here, we do have our final poll question of the day. This is a 100% optional question, just like all of the rest of ours, uh, but it just asks if you would like to learn more about either Risk Out, what we're doing, some of the services and, and solutions that we can offer to help your financial institution, uh, as well as Harris Beach, the firm that uh, Constantine joined us from uh, and the legal service that he and his other partner attorneys can provide. So uh, if you're interested in getting in touch or want to follow up, have a conversation about how either uh, of our organizations are able to help your program and your financial institution, uh, go ahead and let us know on this poll question. Uh, and while we do have that up, I do remind you that you can go ahead and ask uh, questions that you might have in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, this was actually when Constantine helped us uh, last year, we had a session on about a similar topic before the um, the final rule was released on January 1st. We did end up receiving the most questions that we've ever received uh, on, a, on a webinar in Risk Out history. So we know that there are a whole lot of questions. We're going to try and get them uh, answered as best as we can. But of course, if we aren't able to help you out today on today's call, we can always follow up with you afterwards. Um, we had a question coming in asking for a clarification, Constantine, that says, to clarify, should I or should I not be using my beneficial ownership information through 314B? Oh, Constantine, well, I think you So right now, you can use the beneficial ownership. Oh, sorry, my fault. I think we had a little delay. Go ahead. All right. So, so right now you can use that beneficial ownership information. That's the information that you're getting directly from from the customer. But going forward, um, the sharing is going to be a little bit different um, un unless FinCEN comes out with um, uh, different guidance. But right now, um, there should be a caution with beneficial ownership information that you would see that you would receive in the future from FinCEN. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we actually we had a comment come through that I think is quite interesting. They uh, were commenting on how New York is popping up. I know we had a question asking, you know, what happens if this is going to happen in my region as well? And this person uh, points out that there was actually a, a similar case uh, of the Small Business Association of Michigan versus Yellen that was filed just yesterday. So um, it seems like this this might be a trend that we see spill outside of New York uh, for other financial institutions to keep an eye on. Um, we had another question coming in asking, uh, is there an existing Could, template? Correct. There's going, there is other ongoing litigation. Oh, excuse me, Kelsey. I, I think we might have a delay here. My apologies if I spoke over you. All right. So I, I just uh, turned off my camera for a moment to uh, hopefully increase the bandwidth, but um, there are other um, cases out there. So there's other litigation on the CTA and ultimately um, the Department of Justice is now on it, so it will be litigated. But at the moment, I expect that the cases will be um, will be limited to their particular districts. That that makes sense. 
Um, we had a question asking, is there an existing template for building consent forms uh, to give to customers or members, or is that something that each bank or credit union is going to need to build themselves? Uh, right, right now, that's something that you'll have to build yourselves. Um, I don't know that it, it's, FinCEN is not looking for a lot of specificity. So I think that anything that's reasonably been designed or, or drafted will, will work. Perfect. And do you know if there are any costs uh, associated to accessing the FinCEN database? No, there, there won't be any costs. Perfect. That, that's I mean, always great to hear. Another good free thing, right? Well, well, I mean, look, just to be clear, there's not going to be cost in terms of each time you access the database, you're going to have to pay a fee. But obviously, there's going to be cost in terms of setting up the IT and, and setting up the controls and also paying the individual at the, at the financial institution to access the database. So we, we had a question come in uh, that they're, they're a little confused right now. They know that uh, FinCEN has stated that financial institutions will be the last to have access, but then they also came out and issued guidance on how those small uh, financial uh, institutions should access. So what's the situation here? Are they able to access? Do we know when they'll be able to access? So they currently are not able to access the database. The rollout will start with a law enforcement national security. Then it'll go to uh, the federal banking agencies and to other prudential regulators such as the SEC or the CFTC. Then it'll go to financial institutions. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, the, they're going to just do this phased approach or, or delay so that um, when financial institutions have access to the database is also when there will be a new beneficial ownership rule that that affects uh, financial institutions and and that's what i was getting at, getting at earlier when i said that the new that that the new rule will probably be aligned with the cta so that instead of having the control prong you will have then substantial control and that uh, ultimately and the exemptions will be the same so that ultimately the information that's reported to the financial institution will be the same information that's reported to FinCEN. That makes sense. Thank you for, for that uh, clarification. I, I know it can all get a, a little tricky and confusing, especially since we're, we're all kind of working through this together. So um, hopefully it will only become more clear with time. Uh, we did have another question come through and that said, uh, based on the order of access, it sounds like it would make more sense for smaller financial institutions to ask their customers if they have provided information, if they've, if they've reported their business to FinCEN already. Is, is that correct? Is that the right way to kind of think about this? I mean, th th that is certainly an option. Um, and, and that would dovetail a bit with what I said in, um, earlier about um, getting the information that was filed with FinCEN or just getting the, the information w when you have access directly from FinCEN. Now, but as we speak right now, I don't know that it's necessary, but certainly when we get to that um, time when it's phased in and we're still transitioning from the current rule to the new rule, then, then I think that's cer certainly something that should be looked at. Perfect, thank you. And I know we don't want to bombard Constantine here too much, so we've got one final question that we'll ask, uh, and that asks, um, who at my bank should actually determine if we should access a FinCEN's database? Uh, is that typically a decision that's made by the compliance team or, uh, or the board? You know, look, as I said before, I mean, it could end up being a, a much higher level decision, but um, the way I looked at it was ultimately either for the chief risk officer or for the general counsel. That makes sense. Always good to consult your your lawyers before making a, such a, a weighty decision. You know, you know, and and look, let me, let me just point out at, at the end of the day, it's not just a, a regulatory issue, if you will. It 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 ultimately then can lead into enforcement, and how the bank can um, defend itself from an enforcement action. So it really becomes a, a much larger question in terms of whether the bank will or will not um, access the database. Yeah, that's great. I think just to, to reiterate your point from earlier, Constantine, it, 
as long as whatever decision you make either way is reflected in your, your policies and procedures. That's uh, always an important step. Right. Uh, well, excellent. I, I think that's all the time that we uh, have for our questions today. Um, if you do have any that we weren't able to get to or you think of one uh, in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, you wake up and you need an answer desperately, we're still here for you. Don't worry. Just because the webinar is over, we've still got you covered. So you can always reach out to Constantine or Risk Out. You can see our uh, contact information up on the screen currently. But I do want to give a big thank you to Constantine for coming back to Risk Out, having another webinar, and continuing to share his expertise with us. Um, Y'all can go ahead and keep an eye on your inbox as we will be sending out today's recording, the slides, and any additional resources from this session, uh, that, and that will hit your inbox tomorrow. Um, we will also have a brief survey following today's webinar where if you'd like to provide us with any feedback, on today's session or requests for future webinars, we would really appreciate it. So if you could please take a moment and share your thoughts, that would mean a lot to us. Uh, and then finally, you know, if you do have any more questions, if you wanna learn any bit, uh, anything else about Risk Out, or if you just wanna stop by and say hi, you can come visit us at riskout.com. We hope to see you on our next webinar next month, uh, but until then, thank you so much, Constantine, and we hope that everyone on the call has a great rest of their day. All right, thank you very much. Have a great day.